Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you're joining us on YouTube, thanks for stopping by. We're glad you're here and invite you to subscribe to our channel for more videos on all things aphasia. This is Ask the Expert. In this series, experts will be answering your questions related to aphasia. I'll be your moderator for this hour long session. My name is Jen. I'm part of the team at the National Aphasia Association. This year, we're celebrating 35 years of support, providing access to research, education, rehabilitation, therapeutic, and advocacy services to individuals with aphasia and their care partners. Today, we're joined by Dr. Howard S. Kirshner. Dr. Kirshner is a professor of neurology, psychiatry, and hearing and speech sciences at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Kirshner is the Vice Chairman for the Department of Neurology, directs the Vanderbilt Stroke Center, is a consultant at the Vanderbilt Stallworth Rehabilitation Hospital, and is Chief of the Neurology Stroke Division. Today, Dr. Howard Kirshner will be talking with us about cognition. Then we'll open up the floor to those in our live audience for questions. So cognition is, it's a term and comprising all of the mental intellectual functions which comprise the human mind and thought and mainly involve the cerebral cortex. So among these, we're, we're gonna talk very briefly about attention, executive function, memory, language, praxis or skilled motor behavior, gnosis or recognition of sensory items and visual spatial constructional functions. I'm actually not gonna to get to the last three and the picture there is a, is a side view of the brain, the left hemisphere, chosen because of language. And uh, you see in blue there, the Broca area for language expression, and in green, the Wernicke or Wernicke area for language comprehension. So this is, if you're seeing it, it's four views of the brain. Look, again, looking at the left side of the brain or left hemisphere. And these are derived from positron emission tomography scans or PET scans. So when a person is producing words, like say as many animals as you can think of, the area of the brain that lights up you see is in the left inferior frontal region, roughly corresponding to Broca's area, traditional Broca's area. The next one to the right is during a word list summary, reading a word list, it's, it's quite similar. Uh, C is understanding spoken words. So that's catching the temporal lobe, superior temporal lobe. And then D is reading words and recognizing them and that's capturing left occipital lobe. So a brief introduction to the cerebral cortex uh, it has at least 14 billion neurons or nerve cells. That's more than the books in world libraries. 75% uh, of these neurons are in the association cortex. As we'll see in a minute, not areas that do a primary motor or sensory function, but areas that are involved in synthesizing and understanding and so on. So we have three types of association cortex. The unimodal, this is for each sensory modality, such as vision or hearing, there's an association cortex where we take the raw perception in that modality and we relate it to our prior experiences. And then heteromodal association cortex, which is in the parietal lobe, is how we integrate uh, concepts among different sensory modalities. So for example, when you learn to read, you learn to associate visual stimuli with previously learned auditory ones. And then in the anterior part of the brain, lateral prefrontal, there is another part of the association cortex that has to do with working memory. Working memory really means attention. So how you pay attention to something sequential activities like taking steps in a process, attention, and executive function. So executive function, it's a little bit hard to understand, but it's kind of like the executive of a company. That part of the brain decides what's important and what isn't, you know, what's going to be given priority and what's going to be let ride. 
So it, it really, it, it really gives you a lot of your decisions about behavior. And then there's a supramodal association cortex, which is in the orbital frontal region of the brain. And this is thought to integrate internal bodily sensations and emotions and drives with external cessation. And that integration of internal and external is thought to be very important for consciousness. So it oversees the heteromodal frontal cortex in sequential processes and attention. And in the words of Drs. Benson and Ardilla, it's the part of the brain that anticipates, conjectures, ruminates, plans for the future, and fantasizes. Now, consciousness is something that we all understand because we experience it. It's very hard to explain, though, what, what makes us conscious and how conscious are animals, for example. Uh, Dr. Crick, who was the famous Crick of Watson and Crick, the structure of DNA, won the Nobel Prize for that. In his later years, he studied brain anatomy and particularly was interested in consciousness. And he pointed out that in the visual part of the brain in the occipital lobes, most of that is unconscious when you perceive visual stimuli. But when those stimuli are projected to the frontal lobes for attention and memory, that's when they become conscious. And again, it relates to that orbitofrontal part of the brain in which there's an integration of interoceptive and extraoceptive processing. And you know, there are many examples where things that we do in the brain are unconscious. We see things that we don't pay attention to. If we have a split brain operation, half of the brain doesn't talk to us. We all have the experience of driving home from work, and if we drive the same way each day, we don't pay much attention, and yet we stop at red lights and avoid collisions and so on. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit about memory. This, this could be an hour lecture, of course, but we divide memory into three stages. There's immediate memory, which is also called working memory or attention. And people who have frontal lesions have impaired immediate memory. For example, people with strokes who have aphasia have reduced digit span and reduced immediate span. Then there's short term, which is we remember what we had for breakfast this morning, or we remember when the neurologist gives us three words to remember and we have to repeat them after a delay. And this type of memory is thought to involve the medial temporal region, the, especially the hippocampus, the amygdala, which is right anterior to the hippocampus and the medial temporal lobe, is important for emotional memories. And then frontal lobes are involved in retrieval. I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. And then long-term memory would correspond to fund of information, semantic memory, things we've known since childhood. And they're mostly stored in different parts of the cerebral cortex. Okay, so this is from an article by Butson and Price. Uh, you can think of the medial temporal lobes as the recent memory filing cabinet. That's how our brain makes new memories and stores them. But other cortical regions are where the memories go to stay for a while and where we retrieve them later. And then the frontal lobes are the filing clerk that, that tells us when we want to retrieve them, we want to store a memory or we want to retrieve it later. It keeps track of where the information came from, what the sequence of information was, and how we pulled it up into consciousness. So there's a thing called amnestic syndrome, where patients have poor short-term memory and they're not forming new memories. They have a, a variable period of retrograde amnesia. Uh, they may or may not have disorientation to time and they may or may not confabulate. Confabulate means when you're asked something, do you remember such and such, you make something up if you don't remember it. You, you may not do that consciously, but you produce, you produce memories that may not be real. Now, people who have this syndrome have normal immediate memory, so they can repeat digits fine, and normal remote memory. They know where they grew up and who their first grade teacher was, and things like that. 
and they can perform quite well on an IQ test. They have normal intelligence. And also there are other types of memory other than episodic memory that may be preserved. For example, you remember how to ride a bicycle, that's a motor memory. You remember conditioning where, um, as in Pavlov's experiments, un unconditioned stimuli become associated with a conditioned response. I won't go into priming. So someone with the amnestic syndrome can perform an IQ test normally and then not remember taking it five minutes later or remember the psychologist who administered it. And the patient lives in an eternal present and can't learn from experience. So the neuroanatomy of this is damaged to bi bilateral medial temporal areas such as the hippocampus, but also the mammillary bodies uh, part of the hypothalamus and the thalamus, particularly anterior nucleus, and the septal area in the deep frontal lobes. So this is a diagram from Budson and Price's paper showing this is a cutout lateral view of the brain, and we're looking at the medial surface. If you can see my pointer, this is the hippocampus, and it goes via the fornix to the mammillary body here, part of the hypothalamus, that projects to the thalamus, anterior nucleus, and then from the thalamus up here to the cingulate uh, gyrus and through the cingulate tract back to the hippocampus. So it's a circuit and damage anywhere in that circuit can affect memory. So this is a, a patient, an actual patient who had a bilateral medial temporal lobectomy, you know, surgical procedure for intractable epilepsy. And if you look at the bottom right, that kind of looks like a CAT scan. It's showing you that there's missing tissue on the left side of the brain here and on the right side of the brain here. It doesn't look very impressive as to how much of the brain is gone. This is a coronal section, so it's like the patient is looking out at you. So you can see the left hippocampus, which should be sitting here, is mostly gone. The right one is still, it's partially gone, but partially preserved. And this patient had virtually no ability to make new memories over a period of about 50 years that he lived after this surgery. And he became the subject of many psychological experiments. So where, where do you see the amnestic syndrome? Well, you see it with bilateral temporal lobe surgery. You see it after herpes encephalitis, a very bad form of viral encephalitis. You see it in alcoholics who damage their mammillary bodies and thalamus. You see it in strokes involving the posterior cerebral artery territory, but it has to be on both sides. You see it after traumatic brain injury. Uh, after a ruptured anterior communicating artery aneurysm, which damages that medial frontal region, the septum, that's part of the memory circuit. And occasionally patients with tumors. Uh, I once had a patient with a thalamic tumor that crossed the midline and then involved both sides of the thalamus, and he completely lost his memory. Also lesions in the temporal lobe. We see it after head injury. Sometimes it's a temporary period where there's just a brief period of amnesia right around the event. It's partly re retrograde, meaning you don't remember things right before the trauma. And anterograde means you're not forming memories normally for a while. And as the recovery begins, the period of retrograde amnesia shrinks and gets smaller and smaller. So there's after the patient recovers, there's a permanent gap in memory that's the sum of the retrograde memory and the period where new memories were not being formed. And in general, the duration of amnesia reflects the severity of a head injury. So you see people in football games walk off the field and not seem to know where they are, what they're doing, and then their memory comes back. There's also a syndrome called transient global amnesia that I've been very interested in that where people lose their short-term memory briefly, often in unusual circumstances like a big change in the weather or a very stressful event. 
and they keep asking questions about why they are where they are, but they don't lose their memory for who they are or who their spouse is or children are. And it lasts less than 24 hours and recurs. Uh, there's a differential diagnosis. I won't go into them, but it often occurs for no apparent reason. So another form of short-term memory loss is in a neurodegenerative condition. We call it mild cognitive impairment. It's the precursor of Alzheimer's disease. And there is an amnestic form where the only thing that's initially abnormal is short-term memory. And we have to distinguish this from elderly people that have normal aging memory loss, referred to as benign senescent forgetfulness, or the worried well people that are concerned about their memory but are really okay, although recent studies suggest that that actually is serious and predicts future memory loss. Um, in general, patients who have this function fairly well in other ways are often continuing to be able to work, but they may, over a period of years, develop Alzheimer's disease. Okay, a little bit about aphasia. I know that other talks in the series have, have emphasized aphasia. I thought I'd come back to it a little bit because of some recent news events. But basically, aphasia is a disorder of language. And language is a system of symbols that we use for communication. Speech has to do with articulated language symbols or motor speech. And aphasia means that a person acquires a disorder of language because of brain disease. It could be a stroke, it could be head injury, it could be a slowly progressive disease. And by this definition, we are excluding developmental language disorders that children may have, not acquired ones. We're also excluding purely motor speech disorders such as dysarthria where speech is just slurred. And we're also not including the language problems that occur in psychosis, which mainly have to do with the content of thought rather than the mechanics of language. So here again is our diagram. I don't think I will go into it again unless someone has a question. Uh, but I wanted to emphasize just briefly on aphasia that we can think of it in two ways. And in the first way, it's caused by focal or localized damage to the brain, such as a stroke or a head injury or brain tumor. Or it can be caused by a progressive disorder, which we call primary progressive aphasia. And there are three main types of primary progressive aphasia. Uh, first, the first one is a non-fluent aphasia. It looks kind of like Broca's aphasia from a stroke, where speech is halting, patient has trouble coming up with words and names. And we may find on a brain scan atrophy in the left frontal region. I, I won't go into what a telepathy is right now. Uh, there's another type called semantic dementia where there's a progressive loss of word meanings. It's a different kind of brain pathology. And then the third one is called logopenic primary progressive aphasia. This is where people just start having trouble thinking of names and they may have trouble repeating a long phrase but they understand fairly well and they can express themselves except for occasionally pauses while they're trying to think of a word. And this third type, logopenic primary progressive aphasia may be an example of a presentation of Alzheimer's disease. So as you all know, I'm sure most people with Alzheimer's disease present with memory trouble, but a few present with more focal seeming deficits, one of which is this logopenic primary progressive aphasia in which thinking of words and repeating long phrases is the main problem early in the course, but often they will develop into more typical cases of Alzheimer's disease. So I think that's my last uh, slide. I just, I wanted to give you a feel for what cognition is complicated, it comprises many different cerebral functions, and they all 
interact to create our intellect and personality. So let me see if I can stop, stop sharing my screen. There we go. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful information about cognition. Um, can we maybe start the Q&A section by asking if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and about Vanderbilt Stroke Center and maybe a bit about some of the research that's done at Vanderbilt? Okay, well, I mean, I've been at Vanderbilt a very long time, it's going on 44 years. So when I came, it was a small department, but I, I always had two interests in neurology. One was stroke and the other one was cognitive function, especially language and aphasia. And in the early part of my career, I had an NIH grant and I did a lot of studies on aphasia and published a number of papers. And I would say in more recent years, that's kind of been a hobby of mine. I, uh, uh, I'll come back to that question. Um, so I'm still interested in aphasia, but um, somewhere into my time at Vanderbilt, acute stroke treatments came available. And uh, that was exciting to me. And also there was a need for specialized centers to treat stroke patients. Uh, I had also started doing clinical research in stroke because it was honestly a little easier to do than cognitive research. It was easier to try an experimental treatment on stroke patients and treat them as you were taking care of them in the hospital and so on. And so uh, we set up a stroke center back in 1998 and it now has about uh, 11 neurologists that specialize in stroke. And uh, we do a lot of acute stroke treatment. We also have three interventional people, one neurologist and two neurosurgeons, and they go into the brain with catheters and they take out clots and they open arteries and make stroke patients better. That, that and the clot buster drug, TPA, uh, which came on the market in early 1996, those revolutionized stroke care. So, uh, the second half of my career, I really specialized in stroke, acute stroke treatment, secondary stroke prevention, a lot of stroke clinics. And I also used to work in stroke rehab where I had a lot of interaction there with speech pathologists and language people. So all of those have been interests of mine through my time at Vanderbilt. I'm not suddenly not hearing you. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> oh. um, so a question that we had in the chat, and actually we get this question quite often um, in various different forms. So the question in the chat is, how do you overcome aphasia? We've also gotten questions like, how do you defeat aphasia? And I was hoping that you could touch on that question, but also maybe touch on words such as defeat aphasia and overcome aphasia. Well, you know, when a stroke happens, it damages a part of the brain. And often that area of damage is permanent. However, the brain has a certain amount of plasticity, meaning that other areas of the brain can take over functions. And people learn how to do things again that they couldn't do immediately after a stroke. A big part of that has to do with therapy. You know, I'm a big believer in speech language therapy. I, you know, I. I think you know the recent studies are showing that a great deal of recovery happens in the first few weeks. And often, you know, speech language therapy, there might have been an assessment in the hospital, but it didn't really begin in earnest until people went home or to a rehab hospital. And now I think there's increasing recognition that early speech therapy and as intensive a speech therapy as you can manage is very important. I mean, it, it teaches the brain how to, how to develop other areas into processing of language so that people, people regain functions. I don't know if that's enough of an answer. Yeah, and in our chat, we actually have someone who suggested speech language pathology, neurology, volunteering, activities, and support groups. 
and the National Aphasia Association has a bunch of online <laughs> groups that you guys can join, some really wonderful support groups. So um, let's move on to our next question. So someone in our Q&A chat asks, after being diagnosed with primary progressive about two years ago, what use is a PET scan now? Well, it is, you know, th there are different types of PET scans these days, but the, the original one was called an FDG or fluorodeoxyglucose PET. Basically, you take a radio labeled glucose molecule and you infuse it in the bloodstream and it gets taken up in the brain by cells that metabolize glucose. And then it only goes one metabolic step and then it stops because it's deoxyglucose. And it has a radioactive label on it, so it shows up on a PET scan. It's giving you a regional anatomy of where the brain is active, where there's metabolism going on. So, you know, as opposed to a CAT scan or MRI scan that's showing you the structure of the brain, this is showing you a map of the, you know, where the function is, where the brain is activated. And, you know, in a stroke with Broca's aphasia, you would see a hole in the left frontal lobe. But in a primary progressive aphasia, you might see different things. You might, you know, you, you might see a pattern that looks like Alzheimer's disease, where the posterior temporal parietal regions are affected on both sides, maybe more on the left. And that would, that would suggest that in that case, primary progressive aphasia is a precursor of Alzheimer's. In another case, it might show mainly frontal hypometabolism for glucose. And that would be the primary progressive aphasia of the non-fluent type. And then the other type, the semantic one, semantic dementia or semantic cognitive loss, it would be bilateral temporal parietal. And so those patterns are different. And you know it's not a pure 100% correlation, but in general, it tells you something about the disease and what to expect. So I think it's somewhat useful. We also nowadays have amyloid PET that shows you where amyloid is deposited in the brain. And that is a marker for Alzheimer's disease. And also there's tau PET where you're giving a, a radio ligand that binds to the tau protein. And that may be helpful in some other types of dementia like frontotemporal dementia. It's, it's a complicated area that's changing all the time. So, I've given you a somewhat simple answer to a complicated question. Well, we have loads of questions about PPA. The next question um, asks what PPA support groups are available, um, I guess, at, at Vanderbilt University or Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt Stroke Center. Well, um, if you're in Nashville, <laughs> there is a, it's called a community aphasia group. And it's part of the, it's called Bill Wilkerson Hearing and Speech Center. It's a graduate program in Vanderbilt University and it's located in the medical center. And there are a lot of speech language pathologists there, but also people that do research on language and aphasia. And, and they do have an active group on aphasia. And I think, uh, I think, I don't know if they have separate groups, but they certainly have people with aphasia from strokes, but also people with primary progressive aphasia. And it, it's been a strong area of interest. I saw a question pop up about, is there therapy other than speech therapy? You know, I'm, there is a hope that someday we'll understand more about these, these syndromes, I mean, including Alzheimer's disease, that will have treatments that get to the cause of it and prevent the progression of it, you know, as well as just trying to help the patient at each stage of the disease. We, we don't have that yet, but I would say, you know, there are a lot of promising new therapies in Alzheimer's that are in the pipeline. You may have heard about one that was recently approved by the FDA, but it's been very controversial. And there are some for frontotemporal dementia too that are in the pipeline. I think, you know, I think it's a, it's a very exciting time. And uh, I would say there may be significant advances in the next few years. What are some things that um, we can do at home to help with cognition or to help slow down primary progressive aphasia? 
Well, I, I tend to believe that the more we exercise parts of the brain, the better, the better they do. So, you know, if you have a physical weakness, you can do physical therapy, you can do exercise and you get stronger. You know, it may not be curing the disease, but you function better. And I think the same is true with cognition and speech and language that the more you work on them, the more you do therapy, the more you do your own therapy, you know, do crossword puzzles and do reading aloud, and, you know, whatever you can do, the more you activate that part of the brain, you know, the slower it will progress. And is there research that shows that memory activities like brain games and puzzles and even board games can help uh, are helpful exercises for people with aphasia or primary progressive aphasia? Yeah, I, I haven't reviewed all those studies in detail, but I think in general, the answer is yes, that if you, if you practice a function, you get better at it. I mean, we all do that when we take on a new hobby or take on a new interest. And I, you know, I think there is evidence. I mean, the, the problem in Alzheimer's disease is, you know, there are some therapies that are, that are marketed commercially that, that are fairly expensive, that give you exercises and puzzles. And I don't think there's convincing evidence that they change the course of the disease. I do think they train one specific kind of cognitive function and you get better at that function. They have shown to, to do that. I'm also a believer in physical exercise, even for cognitive and language problems. And I see somebody saying he's a runner, biker, and dog walker. I, physical exercise seems to help. And some of it may be just getting more blood flow to the brain. Some of it may be that it, it just stimulates parts of the brain, makes your mood better, makes you adapt better to handicaps. I don't think we understand the full mechanism, but the fact that it helps is clear. It's not controversial. It's been shown in many, many studies. Can you maybe talk a little bit about Bruce Willis? Yeah, I figured that would come up and that's why I put that slide in about primary progressive aphasia. I, but I have to say, I have no personal knowledge of Bruce Willis other than enjoying some of his movies. So, you know, I don't have any insider information for you, but I would gather that if he had aphasia from a stroke or a head injury, uh, that would have been released in the news. <laughs> So my surmise or assumption is that he has a primary progressive aphasia. I don't know which one of those types, of course, but they, they all share the fact that they come on gradually, you know, slowly become recognized and then they slowly get worse. And he seems to have taken a step to, you know, prevent future problems by just saying he's not gonna be in any more movies at the moment. But that's, that's about as much as I know. We got a question about cochlear implants. Have you ever heard of cochlear implants helping people with primary progressive aphasia process or understand words when they're, when they're talking with others? That's a very interesting question. I, I, I'm honestly not familiar with that. I mean, if you have hearing loss, it would help your hearing. And if, if your hearing is better, your language will be better. But I, I, in someone who has normal hearing, I haven't heard of doing a cochlear implant, which, you know, it is a, it, it is a brain operation. It's not something you would undertake lightly. So I'd have, to, I'd have to read the evidence for that. Have you heard of any other types of tools that could help with, um, with understanding communication? Well, there, I think there are lots of tools. They're, you know, going all the way from animal research to computer research to, I have a colleague at Vanderbilt who's just recently joined the board of the NAA, Stephen Wilson is his name. And uh, he is doing a lot of research on what happens to language in the early days after a stroke, like in the first 30 days or so, which is, I think in the past that's been underemphasized. And he has done something like 400 consecutive stroke patients. He, he worked with me on the stroke service to identify all the patients with aphasia due to acute stroke. And he and his graduate students have followed them and tested them. 
And it's yielded interesting things about how aphasia recovers and also the knowledge that I mentioned a little bit earlier that you know the, the biggest improvement is in the first days and weeks after a stroke. I don't, I don't think we really knew that before. He, ha he has a paper that's been accepted for the journal Brain that will be coming out in a few months that I'm looking forward to seeing. Thank you for that. So we have another question that uh, says this person has been exercising and working for 37 hours per day, five days a week. Do you have any suggestions that could help even further? Well, as I said, I'm a big fan of exercise. I think, I think it helps virtually everything in the body, unless you overdo it. And 37 hours a day might be overdoing it. But I, I think that you know, physical exercise helps the body, the muscles, it gets blood flow to the brain. It may help brain function too, in a general way. But I think you also want to emphasize um, oh, per week rather than per day. It's still pretty good, 37 hours, a lot more than I do. <laughs> um, but in addition to physical exercise, <laughs> you want to emphasize, you know, cognitive and language exercise, you know, do puzzles, do word games, um, do whatever you can to be functional, you know, talk up at meetings, you know, help, help contribute to family conversations. I think one big problem in older people is that they may have hearing loss and that compounds it and then they kind of drop out of conversations. So I think getting your hearing tested and getting traditional hearing aids rather than um, cochlear implants, you know, that, that, you know, that's really important for older people. And for some reason, a lot of them, especially men, are somewhat resistant to getting hearing aids. We have another question in the Q&A chat. Have you done any research on those with hemorrhagic brain strokes and why they get migraines? Hmm. Well, hemorrhagic strokes, you know, just in general, I, I have an interest in that. I wrote a review paper with a colleague, Matthew Schrag, the year before last that was, was published in a cardiology journal, Journal of the American College of Cardiology, if you want to look up a comprehensive reference on brain hemorrhage. But I would say in general, people with hemorrhagic strokes, and we're talking here about, you know, the, their hemorrhages, there are four areas. You can hemorrhage in the brain. We call that intracerebral hemorrhage. I assume that's what you're talking about. There's hemorrhage in the subarachnoid space around the brain. And that usually happens from a ruptured aneurysm. That's very different. And then there's subdural hemorrhage that's under the covering of the brain. That usually happens from a minor head injury in an older person, sometimes has to be operated on. And then there's epidural hemorrhage outside the dura that occurs typically from head injury in young people. So I'm not talking about those last three, but intracerebral hemorrhage acts like a stroke. You know, it causes a, a focal neurologic deficit in a patient who's awake. And compared to ischemic stroke or hem, you know, stroke from a blockage in the artery supply, hemorrhagic stroke patients are much sicker acutely. You know, they have a lot of brain swelling and they may even be comatose at first or maybe very sleepy. And they gradually recover. But in, you know, in ischemic stroke, a lot of the recovery that you're going to see in the motor system happens in the first three months. Language, I think, takes longer. But in hemorrhagic stroke, it all takes longer. It's at least six months to a year before recovery is complete. And then some patients do have headaches after hemorrhage. I, I'm not sure they're typical migraines, but I do, I do hear that from a lot of my patients that uh, they have headaches afterward. It's probably because the hemorrhage deforms the brain and presses on the brain. And even after it goes down, there's some after effects. I don't think we completely understand it, but I think it's a true phenomenon. Thank you. Our next question is a live question. This person asked, uh, can learning or using a musical instrument help with cognition? Well, certainly learning helps with cognition. So, you know, reading, learning new information, memorizing new facts, paying attention, you know, if, if 
I mean, watching television is in general a bad thing to do because <laughs> you just kind of sit there and absorb it. But if you uh, are actively trying to solve a mystery or figuring out which character is which and what they're going to do, I think that's useful too. But um, let's see, what, what was the rest of the question? Uh, the question was, can learning or using a can, musical instrument help with cognition? Yeah, so, so music. Um, music and the brain is a whole interesting subject in itself and it's it's complicated because i i think the appreciation of music we think is mostly in the right side of the brain in the, in the parietal lobe and temporal lobe on the right um, execution of music like playing a musical instrument that's a learned uh, skill that's more left hemisphere especially left frontal and these things interact. So if you start listening to music and then trying to play music, you're activating a lot of areas of the brain. And I think that cannot help but, but help the brain, you know, help the brain function better. So I, I think it's a good thing to do and if you can. I think it's important. Uh, so our next question was pre-submitted. This person asked, can banked cord blood be used to help repair damage to the brain? So I'm assuming that means it's something related to stem cells? Well, core blood would just be blood, but um, there is a lot of research going on about stem cell treatments. And uh, there was a big study that was based at Stanford. It had a 10 or 12 centers around the country. I don't, I don't know exactly where that stands now, but. I think it, it does make sense, especially if you have a relatively young patient, you know, who has a considerable life expectancy and is otherwise pretty healthy, you know, and has a large area of left hemisphere brain damage and aphasia, it might be worth an operation to physically implant cells in the brain that can grow and make new connections and perhaps establish new functions like language. I mean, we, we, have, we have a lot of work to do to prove that it's effective and that its benefit is, you know, highly more significant than the risk of a brain surgery. But I think there's a lot of promise in that area. I mean, there's some related research having to do with uh, stimulation of the brain, putting electrodes in the brain and so on. Uh, there have been attempts at stem cells that can be given intravenously, but I don't think that's worked very well. I think you have to get them directly into the nervous system. And to be more specific with this question, this person was asking, um, this person was saying that the banked cord blood was from their son. So would the son's banked cord blood be able to be used for the parent? It's interesting. I have to confess, I don't know much information about this, but cord blood does have stem cells in it. So it would be a source of stem cells. Now, whether they, if you infuse them into an adult, do they get to the brain? I don't, I don't know that. I'm not sure they do. I mean, they might have to be implanted again. But I have to confess, I don't, I'm not fully up on the research on that. It's a very interesting topic. Um, yeah. Okay, so our next live question. Uh, first, they say 44 years. Wow, thank you for your dedication <laughs> to aphasia. Um, have you seen an increase in younger stroke patients during your time, or are we just more aware how all ages are affected by stroke? That's a very good question because, you know, I had the impression we were seeing a lot more young stroke patients. It just seems to match my experience. But our stroke coordinator who keeps all the data from the stroke center said that the change wasn't very much actually when she looked back over time. But I, I do think, I mean, I mean, there's some causes of stroke that are occurring more in young people than they used to. Well, I mean, an example of that would be drug abuse related strokes and bacterial endocarditis from IV drug use and things like that. Another would be, we see strokes in young women, not too rarely. And the way I think of it, there are, you know, there are risk factors for stroke and you have to have a certain amount of risk before a stroke will happen. So, you know, a young woman might have migraine, which migraine with aura is actually a risk factor for stroke. And it's very common, of course, 
Uh, a second one would be hormones, you know, like use of a contraceptive estrogen progesterone agent uh, or pregnancy even. And the third one would be smoking. And we see strokes in young women who have all three of those. I think that, you know, if you, if you have all three of those risk factors, you may get above a certain threshold and have a stroke. Oh, the, there's a fourth one, which would be hereditary clotting differences, you know, which aren't a cause of stroke by itself, you know, like the prothrombin mutation or the factor V Leiden mutation. There, factor V Leiden is pretty common, five, you know, at least, I think, 20% of people. So if you have three or four of those risk factors, you may see a stroke at a young age. If you have only one of them, that would be a lot of, a lot of young women and the stroke risk there would be very low. So I think we are seeing more, more strokes in, in that group. I think this is a great time to plug uh, the SAY Younger Aphasia Group. I'm putting a link in the chat. Um, this is a group that has formed, um, it's led by Kitty, who is in our chat right now, who actually just asked that question. Um, so if you're uh, a younger person with aphasia under 40, at the time of your stroke or brain injury, I would really recommend checking her group out. Again, I've put that in the chat. Okay, our next question is, is aphasia a diagnosis or a symptom? Well, I think it's, it, I would say it's mainly a symptom, but primary progressive aphasia is a diagnosis and you can try to divide it into those three subtypes. But you know, if you have aphasia that's not primary progressive, there's usually a diagnosis. There's stroke or head injury or you know, something of that sort. And then in our chat, we have the question, is there any evidence that PPA is hereditary? Yes, I saw that one pop up. There, that, there's a lot of research on that. And uh, for example, the progressive non-fluent aphasia is due to tau abnormalities in the brain. Tau is one of the main proteins in the brain that goes wrong in Alzheimer's and frontotemporal dementia and other diseases. And there are some forms of tau that are hereditary, the tauopathies. But it's not the majority of cases, it's, it's a minority. Uh, now, when you get to Alzheimer's, that's even more complicated because there are probably a lot of genes that affect your your risk for Alzheimer's. You know, we know some of them, like the apolipoprotein E gene, you know, if you have E4 or particularly two copies of E4, you're at greatly increased risk. There are three mutations that are known to occur in relatively young people uh, with Alzheimer's. And they're quite rare in the United States, but around the world, there have been many families described that have these three muta mutations that have known genes on you know, specific chromosomes uh, that cause, but those are autosomal dominant diseases. So in other words, if a parent has it, half the children will have it. So it, it runs very strikingly in families. And also those families tend to have an early age of onset. So they're, they're very recognizable. On the other hand, if, if you ask you know, a group like this, or if you went out to the bus station and said, you know, how many people here have a history of Alzheimer's disease in their family? A lot of people would raise their hands. I mean, it's a, it's a common disease, so it's thought to be polygenic. Many different genes increase the risk. And there is, a, there is a familial pattern, but it's not like an autosomal dominant. It doesn't mean that if your parent has it, that you're likely to get it. It's still a minority risk for you. Thank you. So we're actually close to the end of our session. We have time for a few more questions. Um, this next one is, does diet play a part in managing PPA? Hmm. Uh, I, I would say that uh, for any neurodegenerative disease, a healthy diet and exercise are important. And what does a healthy diet mean? It means, you know, have heavy on vitamins and minerals, not, not too much fat, uh, 
you know, all the things that we hear from our doctors that we should do to prevent a heart attack or a stroke, they're also thought to help prevent dementia. And that would include, you know, getting enough exercise, eating a healthy diet, getting enough sleep. I mean, an awful lot of people in our society are sleep deprived. I mean, avoiding unnecessary stress. Stress is not a good thing. Uh, not smoking, not drinking excessively. If you have high blood pressure, making sure your blood pressure is under control. If you have high cholesterol, making sure your cholesterol is under control. If you have diabetes, managing it as tightly as you can to keep your A1C less than seven. Those, those are all the ways I know of that you can help prevent a demanding illness and you can all, and as well as heart attack and stroke. And you can also perhaps slow down the progression once you have it. Um, could a stroke be the reason someone gets very defensive or aggressive? My family member responds differently from how she used to and is extreme with her responses. She was diagnosed with aphasia and is diabetic. Yes, well, you know, the frontal lobes of the brain have to do with inhibition, knowing when to control your impulses and you know, when, when to be careful what you say and, and so on. And if, if you have damage in the frontal lobe, whether it's from a stroke or from a hereditary disease or from a brain injury, it will have those kind of effects. So as far as what's causing it in, in that individual, you know, you would do a brain scan like an MRI to see if there's a stroke or other damage. Thank you. And then the last question, what is one message that you would like our audience members to come away with from today? Well, one message is brain is complicated. We don't fully understand it, but I think it's important to pay attention to it. And it's important to keep the brain healthy by keeping your body healthy, by doing all the things I just mentioned. And even if you have aphasia from a stroke or from a progressive disorder, you know, the more you do to keep yourself healthy and engaged and involved and still learning, I think the better you'll do and the better relationships you'll have with your family and friends. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, I'm going to quickly share my screen with everyone. I wanna say thank you to our audience for being here with us tonight. If your questions weren't answered today, please join us again for our next Ask the Expert. Our next one will be May 12th, and it is a conversation with Dr. Sharon M. Antonucci, who will be talking to us about animal-assisted interventions. Um, we also have some really amazing online groups with the National Aphasia Association. Um, to to, sorry, three of our newer ones would be on the bottom of the screen. Parenting with Aphasia is a monthly group that invites parents with kids of all ages to join together and share experiences about parenting with aphasia. We also have Buzzworthy, which is a summer group that meets once a week to discuss topics and buzzworthy news. That's being led by um, members of the Aphasia Center of Acadiana of Lafayette, Louisiana. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, and then we have Game Show, a monthly games group that brings popular TV game shows to life in an aphasia-friendly way. This group is hosted by Courtney Caruso, who is a speech language pathologist at Liberty Speech Associates in Hackettstown, New Jersey. Um, if you are interested in any of those groups, please feel free to email me. My email address is jen at aphasia.org. I'll put that in the chat. That's jen at aphasia.org. I want to thank everyone once again for joining us. If you have any other questions, feel free to email us. Um, Dr. Kirshner wrote in the chat, You're, you are all most welcome. Excellent questions. I enjoyed it. Thank you again. Thank you.